Welcome to Oklahoma Gardening. On today's program, host Casey Hinches explores soil pH with nutrient management specialist Haylin Zhang. Barbara Brown has information on the importance of pH and food preservation. We look at some roadside wildflowers with the Oklahoma Department of Transportation. And Casey has some tips for creating great curb appeal. Oklahoma Gardening is a production of the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the land-grant mission of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University, dedicated to improving the quality of life of the citizens of Oklahoma through research-based information. Underwriting assistance is provided by TLC, Oklahoma's leading garden center, Southwood Landscape and Garden Center, Tulsa's source for great gardens, southwoodgardencenter.com and the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry, helping to keep Oklahoma green and growing. We often hear about pH, but what is it really? It's the measurement of how acidic or alkaline a solution is. And this is important for a lot of different reasons. In water gardens, it can affect the health of our fish. In our own bodies, it can affect our health as well. Typically, you see pH referred to as a number from 0 to 14. 0 being the most acidic, like battery acid. 1 is a little less acidic, but it's still considered an acid, and this would include your stomach acids. 2 is lemon juice. And 3, we've all heard about the corrosive nature of soda pop. Four is tomato juice, five is black coffee, and six is plain old milk. Also at six is your own human saliva. Now at seven, this is the halfway be point between zero and 14, and this is the sweet spot for a garden and a lot of different things. This is where pure water resides and also our human blood. At eight, we have egg whites, and these are transitioning more into alkaline solutions. At nine, we have baking soda. And 10, we have milk of magnesia, which is an antacid. So we often take this to help balance the stomach acids. At 11, we have ammonia that's used for cleaning. As well as 12, we have soapy water. 13, we have a lot of our bleaches. And then finally, some of our most corrosive bases is our drain cleaners at 14. So what does all of this have to do with gardening? Well, just like our own bodies can get upset when our pH is off, so can our plants in our garden. So for more information, we're gonna go talk to the expert. Dr. Zhang, thank you for joining us again. Um, we're gonna talk about pH. Can you explain a little bit of the science behind pH? Well, I'll be happy to. pH is one of the most important tests in the routine uh, package we talked about the last time. So pH basically is measuring the soil acidity or alkalinity in the soil. It's very important. It's just like our blood pressure. We, it can't be too high or too low. Basically, the acidity is the hydrogen ion in the soil, mm -hmm. okay? It's very low, typically it's like zero, 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 one molar, right? Okay. Or 10 to the minus seven. That's how low it is. Well, it's very tedious to write all this amount. So people use the simple negative log to express that, that word uh, equals seven. So they p put a pH there, pH seven. This is how pH is expressed. Okay. In the laboratory, we do all this conversion. We tell you your soil pH is. Okay, so, so you give us whole numbers to work with. <laughs> yes, it typically it range from zero to 14. However, most plants like the neutral range, 6.5 to seven. Right. If the pH is too low, you have a very serious problem. 
when it's too high, some of the nutrients are not available to plants. They're like uh, rocks precipitate in the soil. This is why we like homeowners to pay attention to pH. If there's a problem, we can correct the pH using the products we, uh, available to us. Well, and I think what you said about uh, nutrients being tied up is kind of an important thing because a lot of times we don't realize that we might be fertilizing, but it might not be accessible to the plant if your pH is off. Uh, you are exactly right. You know, some of the nutrients like iron, zinc, those are micronutrients. When the pH is about eight or seven and a half, they become solids. Mm -hmm. So that's why we see iron chlorosis and other problems. A lot of our pin oaks have that problem. Exactly. So if we find out uh, we have a low pH, what do we need to do? We need to add some lime? Well, lime is a caustic material. It brings the pH up or neutralizes soil acidity. Okay. So if a soil has a pH like 5, which is low to most plants, then we add agricultural lime to neutralize it. Well, how much to apply? First of all, it depends on soil pH. Mm -hmm. That's why people need to do a soil test. And that's then, on your basic soil test, your yes. routine soil test. Mm -hmm. Then you find the product. The product will tell you the purity of this. This is like 86%. Uh, if you need a 10 pounds, you need a little bit more than 10 pounds to supply the uh, needed active ingredient. Okay. okay. So you now, would calculate this the same way you would calculate your nitrogen needs and things yes. like that. Yes. People can go to the garden center find that this is a palletized lime, mm -hmm. okay? Now, what is a good time to apply? Typically, it's in the fall. It takes time for the lime to react with the soil to raise the pH. So by the time you do a spring planting, the soil pH should be neutralized uh, to the right range. So if people follow our recommendation, uh, it's very easy to get the pH corrected. And then we've got some sulfur here, which is what you would put down if your pH was too high. Exactly. Most plants can tolerate a wide range of pH, but some plants like azalea or blueberry, mm -hmm. they can grow at normal pH like 6 or 7, but they just don't bear fruits very well. So in that case, for a serious gardener, they would like to lower the pH or add acidity to the soil. There are several products available, uh, like alum, it's aluminum sulfate people can use to acidify the soil. Mm -hmm. But most common is this sulfur. After we put in the soil, the microorganism will oxidize to sulfuric acid. This is how to add acid to the soil to neutralize the alkalinity. Like this one has 90% of uh, sulfur in this uh, product. Mm -hmm. It's very effective. The, you want to make sure to water these in, correct? Yes. Uh, this can add it uh, ahead of time it reacts with the soil very slowly. So you need to be very patient. Uh, there's a fact sheet, I think the title is uh, Improve Garden Soils, has a instruction how much to apply. Typically, just uh, two to three pounds per 100 square foot. Okay. But people need to analyze the soil probably frequently uh, to check to see the pH level. Some of the fertilizers, like this one is labeled for azalea, mm -hmm. also good for blueberry. Yeah. The reason for that is it does, it contains not only the nutrients like nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, it also contains 5% of sulfur. Okay. This sulfur would act to neutralize alkalinity like this pure sulfate compound. This might be something if you just need to slightly adjust your pH lower, whereas if your pH is more alkaline and you need to go a more drastically, then you can use Right, the like these plants like pH about five. Mm -hmm. If you have a pH at eight right now, it will take a quite a bit of sulfur to do that. And this one is going to not going to do the job very quickly. But if you have a pH is 5.5, already close to the target level, this may be very helpful. Okay. 
Dr. Zhang, a lot of people think you can add gypsum to your soil to help loosen the clay, and there's a little asterisk on this package. Can you kind of explain really what the role is of gypsum in the soil? Well, this is another myth. You know, gypsum is calcium sulfate. When you apply this, it does add calcium and some sulfate to the soil. However, the solubility of this one is very low. That means it does not dissolve in water very well. So if you have a normal soil, this would not help very much at all. However, if you have alkali soil, that means the soil has lots of sodium, high pH. This calcium will replace sodium to flocculate soil particle and then improve the water infiltration, also lower the soil pH. So in that case, gypsum is helpful. We have soil tests available uh, to help uh, homeowners identify if you have an alkali soil or not. Okay. Otherwise, it's not going to very help. So really, the take home is gypsum only helps if you have an alkaline soil. You're right. When we talk about home canning, we often talk about high acid foods versus low acid foods. And you'll notice that everything in there has got the word acid in it because basically all foods are acidic. So I've kind of drawn out or laid out a pH scale for you because the acidity is measured via using the pH scale. So we start down here, These, this is the base end uh, where you might find baking powder or baking soda and I didn't put those on the table because you don't can with those but you'll notice the scale runs from 14 and all the way up to zero but from 14 to 7 is where we call base, basic foods or basic uh, ingredients or basic items or alkaline and we just don't have any when it comes to the food category with things that we can at home. So that is pretty much something you can ignore. And what we're going to pay attention to is the area from 7 to 0. Uh, here we have things that do have acid in them and all foods are going to fall in this category pretty much. Now you notice that we start right here at the center line which would be neutral and milk falls into that category. Now you can buy commercially canned milk but you can't find milk at home uh, recipe to do it at home because it's going to curdle on you and not be successful but that's where it would fall on this line. Now you notice that it does go from 7 to 0 and I've drawn an extra tape here uh, at the 4.6 mark and that's because everything that's above this line uh, or on this side of this line has enough acid in it that you can put it successfully and safely in a boiling water canner. There's enough acid in there that it will prevent the growth of Clostridium bacteria which can then produce Clostridium botulinum which could in fact kill you. It may in fact, if you don't do it correctly for the long enough time and in the right container and all those kinds of things, it can still spoil on you. But if it's above this line, it shouldn't be something that's going to kill you. It'll either taste bad so you won't eat it, it'll look bad so that you won't eat it, those kinds of things which will be protective for you high enough acid to be safe. And if you look at the kinds of things that fall over here, it's fruits uh, for all intents and purposes. Apples, peaches, blueberries, which I don't have here, but blueberries would fall here. Strawberries and the lemon over here on the far end uh, with a pH close to a two. Now the other thing that you need to know about pH is that the pH range, there's a range for each of these fruits. So the pH for a lemon may be between 2 and 2.4 because different varieties of lemons, uh, lemons at different stages of ripeness uh, and so on are going to have different amounts of acidity so that uh, we use when we, we can uh, if it calls for additional or acidification, we use a commercially bottled product because we know the acidity is going to be consistent from bottle to bottle, whereas I don't know the acidity is going to be consistent from lemon to lemon or lime to lime. So that's an advantage for us. Uh, now also you'll notice that on this line, uh, these are safe to can in a boiling water canner, is the tomato issue. The tomatoes cross the line and the tomato acidity is going to de vary depending on what variety of tomato you have and what stage of ripeness it's in. The riper it is, the more uh, or the less acidic it's going to be. Uh, the condition of the vines when you harvest, if they're dead or decayed or diseased, the pH is going to drop and you're going to be moving closer to this side. Remember, this is the divider side on when it's safe to go into a boiling water canner and when you have to use a pressure canner. So in, in order to make these safe, 
uh, to go in a boiling water canner, what we do is acidify. So we either add vinegar or we add lemon juice or we add citric acid or something. And that, in effect, moves them all over to this side where it's safe to go here as opposing to having to put them into a pressure canner because we as consumers and, and folks at home are going to have a difficult time knowing without blending it and getting pH paper and all kinds of uh, paraphernalia, which is going to destroy our tomato product, whether or not it's going to be safe enough to go one way or the other. So let's look a little further down the line. These we're going to acidify to make sure they're safe, but on this side of the line, you'll notice it's basically vegetables. Green beans, beets, carrots would fall over here, cucumbers, potatoes, corn meat would fall over here. All of these things are going to have to go into a pressure canner in order to make sure they're safe. But remember that acidification process. Nobody cans cucumbers as cucumbers. We can cucumbers as pickles, which means we're either going to acidify them ourselves by adding vinegar to them, or we're going to do a fermentation process by which some bacteria are going to make some acid. And that enables us to move those pickles because they've become pickles now, from this low side where we're going to have to use the pressure canner over here, they're going to end up right around where the peaches are because we've acidified and that makes it all work together properly. If there's not acidification, which means that we have to have a tested recipe because if you decide to create these cucumbers and turn them into pickles on your own without a tested recipe, you won't know if you developed enough acid to prevent that growth of Clostridium botulinum and you might in fact need to put them in a pressure canner which would destroy the quality of the pickle. So it's basically goes back to following a tested recipe to make sure that whatever method you're using is the one that's appropriate for that product, that it has enough acid, that you're doing it long enough to make sure because it's a balance of time, temperature, and acidity. And while we talked about acidity today, we haven't talked about time and temperature. So I hope you'll keep these things in mind as you're looking for recipes for home canning this summer. For Oklahoma Gardening, I'm Barbara Brown. Department of Transportation, State Maintenance Engineer. And Brad, I hear you're changing your mowing patterns a little bit on the Oklahoma Highway. Can you tell me about that? That's correct, Casey. We are uh, responding to the national effort to protect the nation's pollinators and the monarch butterfly. And one of the ways we're going to be doing that is by reducing our mowing outside our clear zones, our safety zones. Uh, that'll primarily be in areas where we have nice native grass and, and uh, we'll continue to mow uh, pretty much full width in the urbanized areas. In the rural areas, we'll mow a little less outside that clear zone. How big is the safety zone typically off the side of the highway? Well, the safety zone typically includes the median areas unless they're very wide. Uh, but it's typically about 15 to 30 feet, depending on the class of the road you're on. So on an interstate, it would usually be at least 30 feet. Okay, so now you're mowing a little bit later in the spring, as opposed to what you used to do to allow those pollinator plants to grow and seed? Outside the clear zone, Outside, yes. we're going to try to defer as much as possible until mid-July. Okay. Until mid-July. And that'll let the uh, flowering plants mature and those seed pods mature so that when we mow, it will actually shatter the seed and scatter the seeds. That's excellent. And you made a point earlier about this is a national uh, initiative to help save the monarchs because if it was to be on the endangered list, that would become your problem regardless. So you're it, taking proactive measures. That's true. It, it would become a problem uh, for ODOT in that it would start to affect our highway programs and projects and, and it would, might require mitigation, uh, like buying habitat, things of that nature. So. so when we're talking and looking at the highways, it's not just ODOT maintaining the highways that we tend to assume that ODOT maintains everything. Who are some of the other agencies that might be maintaining some of the roads that we see? Okay, so we've got uh, contractors on some of our routes, especially in the urban Tulsa and Oklahoma City areas. And there are a few areas outside there that the contractors do some mowing for us. But our municipalities are responsible for mowing within their city limits on conventional highways. Not okay. our interstates, but on the conventional highways. Okay. So where can people find out more information if they're curious about what y'all are doing to help pollinators? We have some information 
on our beautification webpage, which is also on our website. And they can look at the Oklahoma Native Plant Society website. Okay, excellent. And we do some uh, wildflower planting every year with the Oklahoma Native Plant Society. And that's a, a project of theirs called Color Oklahoma. Okay. And they provide a seed drill and they provide some funds sometimes for flowers, uh, seeds, and then we provide the labor and the tractor to pull that seed drill. So. That's excellent. And so if people want to look at these wildflowers, we are actually just outside of the Oklahoma City Welcome Center here, the Travel Plaza, and you guys have a small demonstration garden of a lot of the uh, native uh, pollinator plants and the asclepias and things like that that they can see as well. We do. We have a, a Monarch Way station here that's been registered with monarchwatch.org. And we have five types of milkweed in the way station and then a number of other flowering plants to provide nectar for the monarchs. Great. Thank you so much, Brad. By now, most people have heard the terminology curb appeal. Um, curb appeal is the attractiveness of one's entrance or home from the curb and as viewed by the street. Here at the Botanical Gardens, we're looking at adding some curb appeal to our south entrance right off of Highway 51. And in order to do that, we need to consider a few factors first. The first being safety. We want to make sure that we are aware of any sight lines as traffic is coming in and out of our entrance. And in a home situation, you would want to take this into account as you pull in and out of your driveway. You don't want to plant anything that's too tall that will obstruct those views so that you can't enter and exit safely. The next thing that you want to think about is the scale of the garden. Here you can see that we have a, a 30 foot wide entrance. We also have 10 foot tall signs and 40 foot tall trees that we're working with. Now, in order to work with that scale, we need to not only consider the size of plant material that we're purchasing, but also the size of the garden bed that we'll be designing. You can see here we've got a bed that's about 25 feet wide. Um, and it's flanking either side of our entrance. Now, we need to think about how we're gonna transition that scale as we go from something low along the curb up to those 40 foot tall trees. So we will need to slowly transition our plant material and our size as we get towards those trees. You also wanna think about this in your home situation. As you get away from the curb of the street and go towards your house, you're gonna to wanna to soften your house with larger plant material. We want to consider any focal points that we have. Here at the Botanic Gardens we have our signs that we want to draw attention to so that people know where they are. In a home situation this might be your front door, it might be a specimen tree that you have, or a water garden. Another factor you want to consider is maintenance. Here, this landscape is outside of our main garden, but it's a very important landscape because it'll be seen by so many people. We're gonna look for some low maintenance, very reliable plants for this design. In a home situation, ideally you wanna put high maintenance plants closer to your home and the lower maintenance plants further away from your home. The final factor that you wanna consider is color. In this situation, we're designing for traffic that's going by at about 45 miles an hour, so we wanna use bright colors that jump out at the viewer's eye. In a home situation where you might have traffic that's going by slower, you could use softer colors. Another setting for softer colors would be the sidewalk as people are walking up to your front door. After evaluating our site and looking at the criteria of scale, transition, focal points, color, and the amount of maintenance, we're gonna take this list of criteria and go find some plants that match. We have now taken those concepts and applied them to our landscape. You can see behind us, we have it planted. You'll notice that we have a lot of bright colors. We have bright yellows and oranges to really grab the viewer's attention. We've got some color guard yucca that are a nice addition. And these are drought tolerant plants, making our maintenance a little bit easier since we are further away from the main garden. You'll notice that we've added some hardscape boulders here. And this was to keep the traffic outside of the bed, but we didn't want to put boulders along the whole edge. So what we've done is kind of lace them together with some smaller but similar stones. Now we have some sedum here that's a nice ground cover 
and this will grab the viewer's attention as they're driving in at the car level. But we wanted to transition and bring that viewer's eye up to the sign. So slowly and gradually, the scale of our plants have gotten larger. We've got some junipers and then we've got some Russian sage that'll get about four feet tall. So this slowly brings the viewer's eye up to our main focal point, which is our sign, our entrance sign. We flank this sign with two Taylor junipers. Again, these are taller and will continue to get taller bringing that scale up to the large height of the oaks behind us. Now you'll notice that we have a very symmetrical looking garden on both sides here and that's to go along with our symmetry that we have by the oaks behind us. You'll also notice that we have a fair bit of mulch still in our landscape and that's because we have planted these plants, many of them being perennials, on their mature spacing. We've got to be patient as gardeners and allow these plants to grow in. We've taken all of these elements to make a beautiful landscape and add great curb appeal to the Botanic Garden here at OSU. Next week on Oklahoma Gardening, we'll look at some research on roadside flowers. Students participating in Camp Turf College Exploration Program will show us how to take a sweat-free soil sample. And Casey looks in on some professional grass brigging in a new attraction at the Botanic Garden at OSU. So join us then for more TV You'll Grow to Love. To find out more information about show topics, as well as recipes, videos, articles, fact sheets, and other resources, including a directory of local extension offices, be sure and visit our website, oklamagardening.okstate.edu. Oklahoma Gardening is produced by the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University. The Botanic Garden at OSU is home to our studio gardens, and we encourage you to come visit this beautiful Stillwater Jewel. We wish to thank our generous underwriters, TLC Garden Centers, Southwood Landscape and Garden Center, and the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry. Additional support is provided by Pond Pro Shops, Greenleaf Nursery and the Garden Debut Plants, and the Oklahoma Horticultural Society.